Uh, it's difficult to summarize Professor Viscusi's work. Uh, some of us struggle for publication here and there, maybe a book. So, you know, he's got like 23 books and 300 articles, you know, which, which puts him right up there. Uh, Kip's books alone on regulating risk in the workplace, Superfund, Hazard Information, Product Liability, Regulation and Antitrust, Consumer Product Safety, Smoking and Risk Policy, all of these are taught across a variety of courses. They've informed the public debate. I think there's some more chairs over here. Are there still some more chairs? A few more over here. There's some more chairs up here, scattered around. Uh, the core of what he's talking about today on his work on the value of a statistical life, besides tormenting the students in my benefit cost class, but his work uh, has set the standard in the field both intellectually and as practical guidance for the government. He was a founding editor and continues as editor of the Journal of Risk and Uncertainty. He served in the government and the executive office of the president, where uh, incidentally he was about three levels above me, maybe it's four, I don't know, but anyway, a couple <laughs> levels above me in a long ago administration who shall not be named. But he served since then on numerous EPA and other governmental advisory committees. More generally, uh, Kip is, uh, will sort of work backwards from his current position. He's uh, Vanderbilt University's first university distinguished professor. Now, before he went there, he hung out at a couple of other places. He had professorships at Harvard, Duke, and Northwestern. Uh, the economic inquiry named Professor Viscusi the second most productive, oh, Kip, that's that silver medal issue again, the second most productive economist based on articles published over the past decade in major economics journals. I'm pleased to say he serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Benefit Cost Analysis, which we edit here at UMBC with the help of Dr. Kokoski. I'm not certain uh, when he takes any time off to relax, but he's a avid runner, bicyclist, and skier. Uh, so without further ado, I want to welcome Kip to speak on the question of what's a life worth? Well, thanks to uh, Professor Farrell for the introduction, and uh, if you got another 50 minutes, then I would, wouldn't have had to talk at all. So. Uh, the, uh, today I'm going to talk about what's a life worth, and we're going to try and figure out what number should we use from the standpoint of government policy uh, to place on expected lives that are saved uh, by government policies. So here's the lady, you know, figuring out, uh, doing a risk-benefit calculation, looking at the menu. And apparently a lot of you did a risk-benefit calculation in terms of coming here. It's a beautiful day. I'm glad either the benefits were greater than the cost or that you had a constrained optimization problem, so you had to be here. But I'm glad you're here, uh, regardless of how it was. And uh, she's trying to figure out, well, she has these different choices. How do you make these choices? So we're going to look at choices people make, figure out, based on these choices, what values are reflected in these choices, then how can we run with these numbers uh, for government policy? So why do we value lives? I'll start talk talking about that. So why do we have to put a dollar value on the lives saved by government policies? Why can't we just say it's an infinite amount? How do we go about doing it? So we'll talk about that second. How do these values differ across people? So should everybody, everybody's life have the same value? Should my life be this, have the same value as your life? Should your parents' lives have the same value as your life? Should your younger siblings' lives be valued more highly than yours? Uh, as you might guess, this is a reasonably controversial area. And uh, among the the various papers I've written uh, uh, were mentioned above. I got a comments on one of them from a uh, reviewer saying, this is the most immoral paper he'd ever read. So welcome to the world of economics. So, uh, so here's an example of some risks. And why are I doing risks that are one in a million? Basically, I'm trying to get across the fact that you can't make your life risk free. Okay, so no matter what you do, you can't get to a zero level of risk. And so the risk's all out there. Here's some examples of one in a million risks. Spending an hour in a coal mine for black lung disease, three hours in a coal uh, mine from accident, 10 minutes by bike, or a good chance of getting hit by a car, 
uh, traveling by car. I got here by jet. I took a you know, one in a million risk. Here's some health risks. Living a couple months in Denver because of cosmic radiation. Now, Mile High Stadium does have its downside. Uh, living two months in an average stone building, and a, a chest ray. Well, my favorite here is drinking Miami drinking water for one year. Uh, so that basically, there are a lot of ways you can get exposed to risks. And no matter what you do, you're not getting to a zero risk situation. The question we then have to figure out, how big the should the risk be that you're willing to face, and how do we strike a balance between the risk and other uh, costs of reducing the risk? So the necessity of trade-offs, we have economic limits. <laughs> Let's say if we took all the GDP and spent it to reduce accidents, so there are 128 accidental deaths per year, and we spent the entire GDP, nothing on anything other than accident reduction. How much could we spend? And we'd only be able to spend $115 million per death prevented. So even if that's all we cared about, you'd be constrained. You couldn't spend more than $115 million per expected death. Once we did that, we still wouldn't have done anything about disabling injuries. We wouldn't have done anything about cancer or any other ailments. So now we've got a great random group of the population here. We're going to run this thought experiment to figure out your value of life or your value of statistical life. So here it is. And I'm going to ask you, this is an audience participation section, so you're going to have to raise hands before it's all over. And uh, so how much are you willing to pay to eliminate a one-time only risk of death of one chance in 10,000? And uh, I'll ask, uh, Professor Farrow not to raise his hand. Uh, last, one time I did this, the sitting in the front row were Kenneth Arrow and Amos Tversky, who were like sort of like really famous economists and psychologists, and everybody waited till their hands went up. When their hands went up, everybody's hand went up. So we're gonna wait, so since he knows the answer, don't raise your hand. So you have to pick one of these ranges. So there's a risk of death of one chance in 10,000, Infinite amount, I'm willing to take that, just the present value of your current future resources, that's fine. All of your, that, I'm willing to call that infinity. Above a thousand bucks, 500 to a thousand, 200 to 500, 50 to 200, and zero to 50. And what a way to conceptualize this, so we got uh, Camden Yards, and so let's suppose there's 10,000 people at the stadium, they look like more, a lot more than that here, but let's say there's 10,000, you're there with 10,000 people. One of you is not going to leave, OK? So the way to think about that, there's a population of 10,000. And the death will be immediate and painless, but you're not going to get a chance to go to another game after this. So the question is, how much are you willing to spend? So who's willing to give me, you raise your hands, infinite amount of your resources, all your present and future resources, to eliminate this one chance in 10,000 risk of death? So nobody. So we've crossed the hurdle that whether life is priceless, okay? So we're dealing in a finite range. How about above a thousand dollars? Couple, few, four, five. So we're starting to come in there. Five hundred to a thousand. Oh, getting okay. a lot more here. Maybe ten percent of the, the crew here. 200 to 500, about the same. 50 to 200, picked up some professors on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but they're older, it's OK. Uh, zero to 50, zero to 50. Well, that it may even be the most popular answer, but it's a, it's a close call. So I think you know, many of you have missed your calling. You should be doing you know, high-level construction work. <laughs> um, so we can translate these numbers into dollar value. So if there's, we'll do the methodology slide in a second. But if there's 10,000 people, each of you is willing to kick in $1,000 to prevent the one chance in 10,000 risk of death, on average, one of you is going to die. The amount of money we can raise to prevent that death is 10,000 people times 1,000, or it's $10 million. So if you said above 1,000, then your value of statistical life, or the expected risk of death, 
is above 10 million bucks. If you said 500 to 1,000, your value is 500 to 10 million, and so on down the line. For the people who said zero to 50, your value of statistical life has been zero and 500,000 dollars. How do you calculate it? Well, you do this, if there's one chance in 10,000 risk to 10,000 people, there's one expected death. Each person, if each person would pay $900 to eliminate the risk, we come up with the value statistical life of nine million bucks. So what does this number mean? We, you know, we've got the number, now what do we do with it? Well, it gives our rate of trade-off for small risk, it's your attitude toward a one chance in 10,000 risk of death. It's not how much you'd be willing to pay a hitman not to take you out. So it's not like reducing the probability of death from one to zero. So it's just reducing the probability of death from one chance in 10,000 to zero or two chances in 10,000 to one in 10,000. So it amount it just states how much you need to be compensated to incur the risk of certain death. So you're not willing to incur a risk of certain death for you know, a million or whatever the, your number was. It overstates how much you'd be willing to pay to avoid certain death because a lot of you don't have the 10 million bucks even though you said it was worth a thousand bucks to get rid of one chance in 10,000 risk of death. And these numbers are used by all government agencies now to value the benefits of government programs. So we're going to talk about how they get into this business and what numbers do they use and where do they get them. So the sources of trade-off evidence, you could do surveys, we could do what we just did here, we could ask people questions. The problem is these aren't real decisions. So those of you who said zero to 50, probably didn't think you're really gonna die, okay? And it's much different if you're faced with a real risk of death than with this sort of hypothetical uh, story you know, as part of a talk. The other source of information is market data. We can look at the amount of money people actually get paid to face actual risk of death. So the job market's one place in the market you could look, and that's the most popular place where economists look, because we have lots of data on jobs and, and wages the workers get. Now you could look at product market price. So safer used cars command a higher price, so you can actually estimate how much of a price premium a safer used car uh, commands relative to a less safe used car. Housing price, market uh, price risk trade-offs. If you live near a Superfund site, you're exposed to some risk, so you can figure out uh, how much people get for that. But the dominant approach is wage risk trade-offs. And I didn't invent this. Adam Smith sort of came up with this idea back in 1776 where you, uh, a theory of compensating wage differentials where he said, if your job is unpleasant, you're gonna want more money to work on this job. So it's a, a theory of labor supply. And economists have run with that, now that we have lots of data that Adam Smith didn't have, controlling for other aspects of the job. So holding everything else constant, how much more do you get paid for the extra risk? So instead of asking people, how much more money do you want to face the risk, to face the risk of one in chance in 10,000? Uh, we actually determine statistically how much money people get uh, for that risk. So here's my favorite risk taker, Jack Bauer uh, from 24, uh, who unfortunately is no longer defending freedom. Uh, but there are less more mundane risks that people take. Uh, they're less exciting than what uh, he, Kiefer Sutherland had to deal with. Elephant handlers in the Philadelphia Zoo get an extra thousand dollars per year because handlers are said to pose a risk uh, to the handlers. Uh, the elephants are said to pose a risk to the handlers that the elephants don't like. This actually turns out to be a real risk. There's a handler uh, in a zoo last year who did die from an elephant. Firefighters in Kuwait got five hundred thousand dollars per year and that's because you know, firefighting in Kuwait was dangerous. All of you drive more fuel efficient cars, small fuel efficient cars, you're incurring an extra risk. So you're doing a trade off, you'll get greater fuel economy and save money on gas, but you're more likely to die. It's that simple. I mean, uh, <laughs> Department of Transportation, you know, they, we have ratings of cars, but they're all rated within vehicle class. And the simple fact is, the bigger, the heavier the car, the safer you are. 
and they have a lot of studies on things called vehicle aggressivity uh, studies, and it's basically all, it's all the, the mass of the vehicle. So, well, let's talk about the average value of statistical life. The punch line is going to be about nine million bucks. So, based on looking across uh, various studies and a review I did with Joe Aldi, as well as recent estimates I've got with Tom Kniesner and Jim Ciliac, uh, we come up with the value of statistical life in the vicinity of nine million bucks. So that if your risk is one chance in ten thousand. The average amount workers are getting paid for that risk is 900 bucks. So the people who answered at the high end actually are, are more right or closer to the work, worker average than people who answered at the low end. As you might expect, foreign countries that are poorer uh, have uh, value statistical life estimates that are lower. So India, for example, has a lower value statistical life. And you know, based on this result, I, some of you may recall Larry Summers got in trouble for su suggesting we su send everything that's dangerous, all our hazardous waste and everything to these underdeveloped countries because they don't value their lives as much as we do. So that those sorts of statements can be controversial. Uh, but I haven't said those things. The history of thinking about it. It used to be the aid government agencies would value your lives based on how much money you made. So they did the same thing that courts now do if you're killed in an automobile crash, what was your life worth? It's the present value of your future earnings. So economists go in, calculate how much you would have made, look at that over time, discount that, bring that back to present value, that's what your family gets. And that's what the government thought your life was worth until the 1980s. It's easy to calculate. Uh, it's used in court cases, so it has some precedent, uh, but it doesn't have a good economic foundation. So for a government policy, the benefits should be how much is society willingness to pay for that particular benefit. So in this case, the question is, what's our willingness to pay for a small reduction in risk? So it's the risk money trade off for a small reduction in risk. Well, the value statistical life methodology, it's good economics, but it's viewed as immoral. Back when I worked with Scott Farrow, uh, in the Council on Wage and Price Stability, uh, we, uh, well, I suggested to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, you know, why don't you use, you know, my, at the time they're called value of life numbers, why don't you value lives based on these numbers? And the, the OSHA head economist for OSHA said, that would be immoral. So we'll see what happens. Uh, happened a couple of years later. The Reagan, here's a picture of Ronald Reagan trying to figure out What's the life worth? And he's trying to do the balancing between money in one hand and lives on the other. So, how this happened? Well, back in 1982, this is after the end of the Carter administration, uh, OSHA proposed what was then the most expensive regulation it, that it had come up with, or the Reagan administration had come up with, which was a hazard communication standard, which for the first time, dangerous chemicals in the workplace would be labeled. The trouble was that you know, this is pretty expensive. So they, light, uh, they had, OSHA had to calculate the benefits of the regulation. And they said life is too sacred to value. So instead they calculated for each life saved, they said, what's your cost of death? And that's the present value of lost earnings. So basically they were valuing lives. But instead of calling it, saying they're valuing lives, they're claiming they're valuing your cost of death. So it's exactly the same thing the value of life thing was doing, except uh, they were giving it a different label and led to a very low value. Uh, the problem is that they sent this regulation over to the Office of Management Budget, which had just started a re test that all benefits of regulations had to exceed the cost. And he said, you know, this, this regulation is sort of interesting, except the costs are greater than the benefits. So we can't let you issue that regulation because it doesn't pass a benefit cost test. So OSHA appealed it to then Vice President Bush, that's Bush the father, as opposed to Bush the son. And um, he said, this is a technical issue, let's get somebody in here to settle it. And I was called in, uh, uh, asked by the Secretary of Labor's office as well as OMB to settle the dispute between the two agencies. And all I did is say, look, don't use this cost of death number, use my value of life numbers, it increases your benefits by a factor of 10. 
Once you do that, benefits are greater than the cost, and you're home free. So uh, they did that, and uh, the day after my report reached the Reagan White House, they issued the regulation, and government agencies started using these numbers. They, I'm not sure if they are persuaded by the intellectual merits of the approach, which is now generally accepted among economists, but they did like the fact that their benefits were cranked up by a factor of 10. And this was hard for most regulatory agencies to pass up. So, my estimates then were $3 million. And back then people said, oh, your numbers are just way too high. So it's interesting, uh, in terms of the historical uh, criti critiques I've gotten, back when I came out with, a, this is in 1982 dollars, $3 million, it'd be higher in current dollars. The numbers were attacked as too high, now we're getting attacked by people that say you should use an infinite value of life, $9 million is too low. So, um, anyway, the reason why I was attacked as being too big, people were at it, there was an anchoring effect of what the present value of lost earnings number was. So, for years they'd be using this number of like $300,000 is what a worker's life is worth, that's how much they're gonna make uh, after their mid-30s, uh, until they retire. So to go from 300,000 to 3 million, you know, sort of took people by surprise. So they responded, I think, irrationally to the change rather than you know, worrying about the substance of where the numbers came from. Historically, the historical context of all this is that the value of statistical life is more supportive of risk regulations than uh, making lives priceless or not quantifying lives at all uh, because it makes life saving look quite attractive from the benefit standpoint. Okay, now that you know everything there is to know about the value of statistical life, we're gonna put you to work about saving individual lives. So, a girl in a well, okay? And it's always the girl in the well because the girl in the well is much more deserving than the boy in the well, <laughs> okay? So we've got a girl in the well and the mayor's come to you and you've just seen this talk about the value of statistical life. And the mayor says, we can get her out but it's gonna cost maybe $15 million to get her out of the well. You just heard this, you know, the value of statistical life is only $9 million. So it's gonna cost $15 million to get her out. Who's willing to do the courageous thing and tell the mayor, leave her in the well? <laughs> so it's just too expensive to get her out. Too expensive. You got a couple, a couple who will let her go. Uh, three, three. Uh, trap coal miner. How well do you think that would play? I, I grew up in Kentucky, and, and whenever there's a coal mine disaster in eastern Kentucky, if they ever said they weren't gonna bother to get them out because uh, it would be too expensive to get them out, it would be sort of like one of the more violent scenes from the TV show Justified, where all the people who run the coal mine end up dead. <laughs> so that, I think, yes, you cannot just say it's too expensive to get them out. And the same thing with the girl in the well. The reason is that these are identified lives. This, you're taking the probability of death from one to zero, which is a whole different ball game than reducing a risk by one chance in 10,000. Beached whales, same thing. We spend millions of dollars to unbeach whales. I always was puzzled by this because I never knew why they beached themselves to begin with. <laughs> but anyway, we do. We spend millions of dollars to unbeach them. Uh, so identified lives are different than statistical lives. So when you're applying these numbers, we're not talking about certain death. We're only talking about very, very small risks. Possible variations. So the value of statistical life number may not be the same for everybody. It could be different by income. Bill Gates may have a higher value than mine. I bet he does. Age. May vary with age. And we'll talk about that. Immigrants. We're going to talk about immigrants. How well do they do? What's their value of statistical life? So let's talk about income. So first, should income levels matter? Well, if you're doing just the present value of lost earnings for a court case, the damages number is proportional to your income. You make twice as much, you get twice as many damages. Your willingness to pay for safety is gonna go up with income. So uh, if you're more affluent, you'll spend more money on safety devices uh, fancy cars with more safety equipment and so on. And should we be providing programs the poor don't value but rich do? Airline safety, I first got into the income issue with respect to airline safety when I did a report for the FAA 
But they wondered, can we use a higher number than the rest of the Department of Transportation because the people who fly on airplanes tend to be richer than the people who are killed in car crashes. So I think the, good, the case study here is planes versus guardrails. I think one main difference is that for guardrails, we're taking public money to put up the guardrails, whereas in the case of airplanes, we're not sort of giving away public money to make them safer. We're imposing regulations. And to the extent that airplane passengers are paying for the safety with a higher ticket price, I'm less averse to that than if we're subsidizing people just because they're rich. Street income levels matter. Car here's a Carnival Cruise Lines. So let's say they sold tickets. So for first class passengers, you can be on a lifeboat. If you didn't get a first class ticket, you have to swim ashore. <laughs> Well, this, this would be great, you know, economists might think, you know, ex ante, this looks sort of good. But then when the ship's sort of going down, this is a recent, this is not the Titanic, this really is the Carnival Cruise Lines. Uh, when the ship is going down, it's hard to enforce this. My first class ticket entitles me to a seat in the lifeboat, whereas your cheaper ticket does not. It's because after the fact, you know, death is not a low probability, it's sort of a certainty. Well, it looks like you can sort of make it ashore. Uh, so yes, in this case, you wouldn't want to have any income uh, differences. Uh, income levels in government practice. Department of Transportation uses our income elasticity numbers of about a half. And although more, more recent estimates say it's about one. So using our more recent estimates, if your income doubles, your value of statistical life goes, is double. Now, does the Department of Transportation use those numbers to say rich people's lives are valued more than poor people's lives? No. What they do do is say, if on average society's income in 2013 has gone up by 10% over 2012, they will crank up the value statistical life number by 10%. So they're just going to do it over time to increase the value statistical life. They're not going to get into the business of making adjustments at any point in time which would be much more controversial and would you know, lead to you know, considerable controversy. Uh, let's move on to the next thing. Let's do old people. Are older people's lives worth less? And this has been the main area that government agencies have focused on in terms of income differences, you know, in terms of value statistical life differences. The older you are, the shorter remaining life you've got. So most of you in this room have a longer life expectancy than I do. Uh, often the older you are, the worse health you'll have. Uh, so I haven't gotten to the stage where you know, everybody sits around talking about their ailments and their prescription drugs. But I know that you know, for a lot of retired people, that's all they do. <clears throat> So, should we use a lower value statistical life number for students than we do for all the professors? A higher value statistical life number for students than we do for professors, because you've got a longer future lifetime uh, at risk. Well, the correct approach is how much is the willingness to pay for risk reduction uh, vary with age? And I got into this age issue uh, when I observed my son. I drive you know, cars with all the safety devices known to man. You know, they come from 110 miles an hour to zero like instantaneously, great brakes and so on. Whereas he you know, drives around in a topless Jeep Wrangler. So I said, this doesn't seem to make sense. He's got more of a future lifetime that's at risk than I do, yet he's doing much riskier things. Uh, so you know, how is this consistent with these value statistical life studies? So, we're going to look at the age issue, and that's the question, should there be a senior discount for the value statistical life? Well, EPA did this. They went where no agency was willing to go before, and they used a senior discount of 37% and analyzed one of their regulations, a Clear Skies Initiative. So what that meant is we use a value statistical life number for everybody else, but if you're over the age of 65, your life is worth 37% less. What do we think? Does that sound pretty good? Well, seniors did not like this at all. So here's this lady. 
and this is a true picture, you know, 37% off. <laughs> and the head of the EPA, when she'd go around and give talks, AARP just brought people out in droves. They just went ballistic, okay? So you can't say seniors' lives are worth 37% less. Uh, she resigned shortly thereafter. It's not clear what the causality was, but it was, you know, shortly after EPA discounted seniors' lives. So are age differences fair? So we can start off with fairness. Is this a fair thing to do? Now economists don't really much care about fairness, but I thought we'd give fairness a shot. Uh, well, is the same value for statistical life fair? So is it fair for me to have the same value of statistical life as for you? Or to take people in a nursing home, people who are in a nursing home aged 85, should they have the same value of statistical life as a high school student? That, that could be fair, that would be fair. Alternatively, how about the same value per year of life that you've got? So if for each year of life that you have left, how about equating that? So that, that would be another way to think of fairness. Each year is worth the same amount for everybody. So if you have 20 years of life left, it's worth half as much than if you have 40 years of life left. Well, rather than engage in these fairness discussions, which I don't think really resolve things, we're going to return to first economic principles. We don't care about fairness. We care about what your willingness to pay is. That's the basic principle for all benefit assessment. And the question is, how does willingness to pay for safety vary with age? So age in the labor market. There been a series of studies over two decades. And the more recent studies, we've been using age-specific risk data. And the result is the value of statistical life rises and then tapers off, then falls a little bit as you get older. And uh, it's flatter if you take into account how much you know, people spend on consumption. So that basically, the same pattern of earnings and consumption over the life cycle is mimicked by the value of statistical life. We got a picture coming up. And the curve in yellow is the one that is the better one, adjusts for um, the cohort. So this is looking at a large data set over you know, 19, 1993 to 2000, so those years of uh, the current population survey. So you can see the value of statistical life there in the low end. For, so if you're 18, and these are in year $2,000, so you want to crank it up. Their lives, based on their labor market decisions, are worth about $3 million bucks. So they're taking riskier jobs, the one chance in 10,000 risky job, for like $300, bucks, $350. It peaks here, uh, I'd say you know, somewhere in your 40s, late 40s, around $8 million. And the interesting thing here is you know, when you get beyond that, it doesn't drop off the table. So for people age 62, it doesn't sort of uh, drop off completely. It's still higher than 18-year-olds. So even though you're at age 62 and uh, older and have a shorter future expected lifetime, because you're richer than you were at age 18, you still value safety, and you're not willing to engage in uh, death-defying death -defying stunts and uh, risky behaviors. So value statistic of life does not peak at birth. So if you look at some economic models, or the you know, economists are known for building you know, silly models, and, and a lot of, and the standard economic model would say, your value of life peaks at birth because you can just borrow and lend on all your future earnings, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't plummet as we age either. It doesn't drop off the table uh, so that uh, your life doesn't automatically plunge as you get older. And as I said, for workers age 60, their value of statistical life is higher than for workers age 20. <laughs> and if we use the value of statistical life by age, it may not be controversial if done correctly. In fact. There's no effect, uh, we did this analysis, we redid the Clear Skies Initiative analysis using our numbers. There's no effect on the benefits if you do it right. So uh, and doing, making age adjustments really is a non-issue from a policy standpoint, uh, although it's very controversial if you do it, but there's no payoff to, to creating the controversy. You can do value per year of life, which I'll only get to the picture. And here, let's see, the value per life year peaks at around $400,000 and it peaks in your you know, mid-50s, mid to late 50s. So for each year of life, 
because the value of statistical life doesn't drop off the table when you get older. You're in effect value each year of life more as you get older, and so that's why it stays uh, quite high. In fact, the workers age 62 here are valuing each year of life at $350,000. So extending, having a probability of extending life by an extra year of one chance in a thousand would be worth you know, $350. Okay. Not all workers can pick jobs from the same set of available jobs. That's what the theory up till now assumed. And uh, I have a series of papers with Joni Hirsch where we looked at different labor market opportunities for different workers. And uh, one way you can tell that workers have different opportunities if the workers face greater risks and get less hazard pay for these risks than other workers then they're facing a different set of labor market opportunities. So I'm gonna skip the picture, but you can assume this is the high wage group, this is the low wage group, and if you had your choice, you'd rather have the high wage opportunities. <coughs> We're gonna give examples of the real world of where we found differences. Smokers and non-smokers face different opportunities. Smokers have lousier opportunities than non-smokers. Black, white, value statistical life differences. So African-American workers have worse job opportunities than whites, and that's gonna affect the estimates. But I'm gonna talk about immigrants. So the most recent work with Joni Hirsch on immigrants, how do immigrants fare? And the reason we got into that is that there's a lot of talk about immigrants doing the really dangerous jobs in society. How well do they do on these dangerous jobs? Do they get compensation for these risks? Well, we looked at, for native U.S. people, <laughs> Uh, the, value st the value statistical life came out to about eight million bucks. <coughs> Mexican immigrants face a higher risk. This is risk per hundred thousand. Instead of 4.35 at six, so it's like 50% higher fatality risk. They don't get significant compensation at all. So we have Mexican immigrants who are not, they're on the riskier jobs, but they're not getting compensation. And the big gap here, Mexican Im immigrants overall, this is based on another sample here, they don't get significant compensation, but the ones who speak English do. So what seems to be happening is that uh, Mexican immigrants who do not speak English are in high risk jobs, are not getting compensated for these jobs. And this is the finding that, when well, I present these results at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, you know, they thought these were interesting because it's a question of whether uh, government information about job risks, all the various requirements about communicating risk to jobs, are they actually reaching these workers who do not speak English because it's clear they're not getting the compensation uh, for the risk. So uh, these are situations where you wouldn't use a low value of statistical life number to value the benefits for these groups, but you can draw conclusions about the dearth of good labor market opportunities for them. Let me talk about one last policy issue, the devaluation of life, uh, which is uh, something EPA did, not all of EPA. The EPA Air Office sat around there looking at these various studies, survey studies. They had one I did with Joe Aldi and two other ones. They sort of stared at these studies and through a process that, for which they've never disclosed the procedure, uh, they said, well, staring at these studies, we used to have a value of statistical life for $8 million. Now we're going to lower it to $7 million. Not a big change, $8 million to $7 million. But this was the Bush administration, and as you might guess, you know, it was controversial. Stephen Colbert did a great segment on this. Because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, the you know, people woke up at EPA and decided your lives are worth a million dollars less than they were yesterday. Uh, and it was an economic puzzle to me since, wait a minute, income levels have been going up over time, so how, and since your value of statistical life is supposed to go up with income, how is it that the number's going down instead of up. So you'd expect a rise in value of statistical life. So there are two meta-analyses where meta-analyses are basically surveys. <laughs> and they stared at the surveys, did not tell us how they came up with the numbers. We have a higher number. Our number here comes out to nine million bucks. They must have had, a, they had a, their numbers lower. Uh, so they weighted them through a mysterious process and came up with a new low number. 
Well, a political firestorm ensued. Was this a Bush conspiracy to devalue lives and to stop government regulations? But it was interesting. What got people's attention was not the level so much the direction of change. The fact that they lowered the value of statistical life mattered more than the level because even the air office's $7 million number was bigger than anything the OSHA used, bigger than the Consumer Product Safety Commission, bigger than most other agencies. Uh, but people didn't like the fact that, you know, the direction of change. So this is like Kahneman and Tversky's loss aversion. So you don't like things being taken away from you. And this is a situation where people thought things were being taken away from them. And because there was no rationale given for it, it looked like a political thing. Uh, well, Senator Boxer proposed legislation where hereafter the EPA can never lower the value of statistical life for all time. They can only go up. <laughs> and differences in the value of statistical life across the population are prohibited. The good news is this didn't pass, but uh, anyway, EPA and other agencies, as far as I know, are only raising the number. So where are the conclusions? Well, first, in terms of the overall level, I'm comfortable with a $9 million number. So if you're leaving this with one number, $9 million is a pretty good number to me. And I think that's the number that Department of Transportation and other agencies are soon going to adopt. Uh, age, income, and other influences are controversial. But if you did it, it probably wouldn't change policy outcomes anyway. So why do you want to get beat up by trying to <laughs> incorporate all these differences uh, in your analysis? Uh, much of the controversy about the value of statistical life is that when people think of the economic value of life, they think we're sort of bean counters and then we're just pulling out people's tax returns and figuring out based on your tax return what you're worth. No, we're going back to your preferences and asking based on the preferences of the people who are protected by the regulation, how much do you value the safety? I think that's a whole lot better than asking what does a government bureaucrat think that the greater safety is worth? I'd rather you know, go back to the fundamental principle of what the people's own values are. Uh, so the benefits will be grounded in society's uh, willingness to pay. Monetizing these benefits makes them matter. If you look at EPA regulations, EPA is the cancer agency. Almost all the benefits are driven by the dollar value they place on cancer, which come from these values to statistical life studies. So that the lion's share of the benefits that they're claiming are derived uh, from these analyses. And they do, in fact, generate a huge benefits. Uh, there are some people, some critics, uh, mostly law professors who don't know any economics, who suggest that benefits should be treated as priceless. But it took so long, uh, it took years for, the government, for us to get the government to put a dollar value on things that were supposedly unquantifiable, like the value of statistical life, the value of environmental amenities. Before that happened, they're in effect treated as worthless. So I'd, I'd be happy uh, to proceed using these relatively high prices that we've come up with, uh, rather than putting a zero price on them, but saying that they're priceless. Um, questions? Why don't you just uh, take a point? Um, on the plot that you showed before that kind of went up and then down, you said the peak was around $400,000. Was that, was that the user? For a year. For a year? For a year of life. OK, so like $4 million for a life, or 49 for life, uh, Well, the same peak for life, for life was around $8 million and $2,000. So it's for, it's for a year, but it's discounted life years. So you have to do the present value based on your rate of interest. Rate, you have to wait each year of life. You just don't add them up. So, you, okay. yeah. so it's not just an area under the curve? So. Uh, no, because, well, this, you know, it would be similar, yeah. It would be similar to that, but you got to discount the stuff. How would you value the gender difference between you know, men, men and women? Um, the good news and bad news is that women don't kill them, get killed on the job very often, except if you're working in a convenience store and you know there's a hold up or if an irate boyfriend comes in and shoots the woman. So, but, uh, so we don't have a lot of data on women. So, but there have been some studies on women, and uh, we found that they're relatively close. Women tend to be lower because, well, the, mathematically it works out to, you know, 
it ends up being a linear function of your wage. Your wage does play a role in calculating the value of statistical life. Once you lower the wage rate for the same uh, effect of risk on your log wage rate <laughs> on your, on, in the equation, it's going to hurt you to have a lower wage rate. So that's how women get penalized. Uh, it's also said that women are more risk averse than men. So there's right. a whole literature on that. Right. So how can we reconcile you know, these studies, which the labor market studies may not be the best place to look for women uh, because they don't get killed you know, with enough frequency to really pin down what the number is. But to the extent that we know the number, it's in the same ballpark as men, but you treat with some caution what, are, what the number really is. So, back. Is it fair to label, uh, is it fair to label the body uh, based on the age group? When it comes to productivity in that environment, the population, when it comes to age, it's more of a So I can't hear the whole question. Can you do it louder? Yeah, what I'm saying is that if it's fair to label the, uh, the value based on the age difference when it comes to productivity in the community. What about the age difference? And how it relates to the productivity in the community? Is it fair to uh, oh. incorporate those things? Um, so the question, uh, to what extent do we worry about your productivity? A lot of that's incorporated in your own willingness to pay. So your own valuation. So then we get into how much do we care about your life? You know, how much do other people care about your life? So these are only your private values. So to the extent that other people care that you're gone, uh, then that would be on top of this. Uh, the approach is looking at productivity that I'd lump them in with the first set of uh, numbers dealing with the present value of lost earnings. So in that era of studies, they would value your lives based on productivity, which would include your inc basically your income. There are other studies that propose, well, why don't we value your life based on the taxes you pay? Well, you know, you're worth what you contribute to us. Uh, I didn't like any of these. Or they, you know, they've sort of gone out, out of favor. But what still should matter and could matter is how much we all miss you <laughs> You know, when you're gone, to the extent that you don't take into account when you value your life how much everybody else is going to miss you after your death. If you already incorporate that altruism, then we've already gotten it in there. Um, but it's probably not complete. Yeah, this is a, uh, uh, Western Europe's pretty good. Uh, so England, you know, they do similar kinds of studies there, although there they rely mostly on survey studies because for some reason their labor market data is no good. But, you know, th this is a co this, there are studies out of Sweden, uh, all over Europe. In fact, there's a, a documentary filmmaker coming from Germany to my office in October to film about the value of statistical life. And I, I didn't even know Germans cared about the issue, but they do. Uh, so, yeah, and one reason is that the EU uses the value of statistical life numbers. I think the, well, the interesting difference, one interesting difference is the EU has uh, more formal procedures for dealing with cancer. Is, does cancer get a bonus? I might as well talk about it. Slightly different topic dealing with Europe. And they value a death from cancer as being twice as bad as a death from an automobile crash. So, yeah, lots of these, all, I, this methodology certainly is spreading among the OECD countries in terms of what they're doing. And there are estimates now throughout the world, like uh, South America, so we're, um, lots of estimates coming out of India, Taiwan, Japan. So. Uh, there's a lot of international evidence, and generally, the richer you are, the better off you are. And since Europe's relatively affluent, they're similar to us. That's where the 37% number came from, by the way. The 37% number that old people's lives are worth less came from a survey done in the UK, where they asked people, how much is it worth to save people in traffic accidents? And the people in the UK 
I guess they don't like their older people as much as we do. <laughs> <laughs> do. you think it's getting harder to assess the value of life over time? And many of the studies using jobs or consumer behavior would have perhaps been done during a time when people could recognize risks much more clearly because they were working with saws or driving cars where just a seatbelt would save them. Now we are protected. We have technology that's changing rapidly. We work in women's kinds of jobs. We work farther away from machinery. Uh, and healthcare technology has changed so much that it's easier to be saved from stupid and risky things. Yeah. It was a lot easier to play this game when I first got into it. Uh, when I did my doctoral dissertation in this area, the average fatality rate on worker jobs in the United States was 1 in 10,000. Now it's 1 in 25,000. So it has gotten safer. Uh, but we have much better data now, so at least that's a plus. Uh, the risks that are really hard to get a handle on, which we haven't gotten a good handle on, are health hazards with the latency period because they don't get picked up in the statistics. So to the extent that we want to get a handle on those, you have to rely on survey evidence. But for the market data, there still seems to be enough people dying and good enough data that we can pin things down actually more precisely now because the government does a, a census where they count every person who dies in a job accident that's verified using three or more different sources of data whereas before they relied on voluntary reporting and wasn't very good. So the quality of data has gone up even though fewer people are dying. So on, a, on balance, I think we're on the plus side. We're doing fancier things than we could ever do before. Sure. Yeah, but a question sort of building on that is, um, is there a difference between the value of life to the marginal worker who takes a risky job and the average person? You know, if there's you know, if there's like a, a hundred jobs out there, a hundred people, and only five of them are risky, and ten people don't care, then the risk premium would be zero. But for the ninety people who do care, it would be a lot higher. So, is, is there is there any sort of issue in sort of going from the marginal, how much you have to pay the marginal worker to take a risky job, to what the average person's risk preference is? We've actually looked at that too, uh, recently, and it's really interesting. Uh, the people who are in the relatively safe jobs, their value statistical life is over $20 million. So they have really high values. They're, you know, A lot of people here could not be enticed to work in a coal mine, even for reasonably good hazard pay. And, uh, so, um, and that's reflected in these statistics. So yes, uh, I think because you're only getting people, who've, to the extent that you're getting people who've sorted themselves into risky jobs, well, we, we looked at different segments of the labor market, and the, va the values, particularly the high end, get to be really big. So that I think the people here who said above $1,000, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, that's not unreasonable at all. Sure. Um, would, uh, would there be a way of easily taking your models and applying them towards uh, an organization like the military? in terms of differences between combat pay and base pay? And if so, do you think the government would be uncomfortable with that? Yeah, the military, that's a, the military is able to survive on a lower cost basis because they don't run a market, sort of like, go take that hill. You know, you don't say, oh, I'm not getting a sufficient compensating differential for that one. <laughs> uh, so I don't think I'll do that today. Uh, so I, yes, I think the military definitely, you know, they're getting bargain prices on these things. And the uh, military is getting a lot of attention, like the war in Iraq. So some economist, Stiglitz, who was a member of uh, Clinton's uh, Council of Economic Advisors, they've done calculations of the cost of war. And if you calculate it using these numbers, then they, you know, they get to be very big. Um, some economists are also looking at, is it hard to recruit people in, a, in the draft, not the draft, the volunteer army, in wartime, yes, and how much, what can we do with that? Um, but yes, that, this is a hot area right now. So we don't, we don't really know the answer of what the value statistical life is based on enlistment rates. Um, but people are trying to figure that out. In fact, yeah. Um, first of all, I like to say I, I do believe that we need operational numbers. So we can't get away from that. We have to place some monetary values. Just the workings of government or society. But 
I see sort of an issue of class warfare here. Two issues. The first, people's preferences as they reveal them to be differ from what they declare them to be. I could say, value of life to me is worth $9 million, but then my actions speak otherwise. We're gonna we're gonna base the policies on what you do, not on what you say. What you do. Okay. So uh, these situations where we look at what you say would be for things like cancer. So willingness to pay to prevent cancer, and we just and if you do the survey right, so we just did this for EPA. For they want to figure out how much is it worth to clean up drinking water in the United States. One risk of drinking water is cancer especially if you have arsenic exposures to drinking water. So we had a detailed survey, figuring out how much of an increase in your water bill you're willing to incur to have a reduced risk of bladder cancer from drinking water, and worked out the value, statistic, value of a case of cancer was like $12 million, which is pretty close to the $9 million. So it wasn't like off the charts. In fact, usually for like auto accident surveys, how much you're willing to, to pay to reduce the risk of death in an automobile crash, the numbers come out lower than these $9 million numbers. They're consistently lower, so that, which is why surveys that include, you know, these meta-analyses that include survey or contingent valuation, stated preference studies, they tend to have a lower number than these labor market studies, probably because people, like a lot of people here, didn't think I was really going to kill them. You know, so they, they don't take the risks as seriously as they do in the real world. Uh, you can do the rich poor uh, problems differently as well so if my value of life or the average person's value of life is nine million dollars then it's optimal to have a lot of expensive gadgets on your car to make it safer and doing that's going to raise the price of cars to everybody including those who can't afford those extra things so uh, you know like my, my car I think has an extra thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of fancy brakes and safety equipment that most people would not value. Uh, now, should we require everybody to buy, you know, cars that cost as much as a person's house? <laughs> you know, you know, so, you know, there's, um, so there's the class problem there too. I think the, the closest we've gotten to solving it is using the same value for everybody. So the government does not distinguish whether you're rich or poor when they're figuring out if a safety regulation makes sense or not. Rich and poor are protected equally using the same average value. And that makes a lot of sense for EPA policies because they're broadly spread across the population anyway. Perhaps following up on that, what about characteristics of, of dying? There are these issues of dread or death by terrorism or by natural hazard. Are there uh, differences by the nature of dying? Well, thanks for that setup question. <laughs> uh, the, I've actually done a study on terrorism risks. And so which would you rather do? Uh, save, you know, 100 people from getting killed in a terrorist attack in the United States, as opposed to in the Libyan embassy. So, or save 100 people from getting killed uh, from natural disasters in Louisiana, where my daughter lives. So there are a lot of natural disasters there. and. Generally, people are willing to pay twice as much to save lives from a terrorist attack as from a natural disaster. And one reason is that uh, with a terrorist attack, what's involved is not simply the lives that are being saved, but also the whole idea of national security, national defense, national pride. And with uh, natural disasters, lots of times people say, well, I'll bail them out this time. But then we ask them if they, go, if they continue to live in the same area and they get hit again. With, you know, with, a, with a hurricane or a flood, are you willing to bail them out the next time? And generally, 
uh, the public is less willing to bail them out the second time. It's easy enough to say in advance you won't, you're less willing to bail them out because I think after it happens, they'll still bail them out because you, know, you're, you actually have a person who's, once they're hit with a disaster, you still respond. So Maybe last one or two questions. One more question. So in addition to risks of death, um, there are risks associated with disability from illness or injury. In healthy economics, that's usually handled with quality adjusted life years and valuation for that. The value of $9 million per life, can you relate that to what that would be for a quality? Okay. The, uh, so this is the quality adjust, or should we look at uh, value, value lives lost or saved by the quality adjusted life years is the general question. Uh, first of all, the value of life years is not the same. So wholly apart from the quality differences, you know, if you saw from our earlier chart, it rises then, then falls. So, so I have two bones to pick with the quality, quality people. First is that it's not a constant value. Uh, the second thing, is that a lot of the quality adjustments done by the health people, I think are just arbitrary. So they'll ask people, they'll, well, they'll take a survey and they'll ask doctors, okay, scale on a zero to 100, how bad is it to have a broken hip? Well, I'll give that a 50. Now, how bad it would be to have, you know, a you know, broken collarbone? You know, that's not as bad. You know, on the badness scale, I'll give that a 30. Well, this is sort of junk. I mean, these are not willingness to pay numbers. They're arbitrary scales, but these are widely used uh, in other contexts. So if you use, if you derive the quality, and I think quality of life matters, if you use it or develop those numbers using a willingness to pay study, where you say how much is, are you willing to pay to reduce the risk of being disabled or having chronic bronchitis, which we've done, uh, that would be fine. So I think it depends on how you do it. So a quality study done correctly, which is not the norm, I think would be fine. So yes, quality of life matters, length of years of life matter, uh, and even though age is controversial for the value of statistical life, routinely government agencies like the FDA value, how many years of life do you have left? How many quality adjusted years of life? And just attach a dollar value to each quality adjusted year of life. So they do take age into account as well as the quality of your life. We did one, one last thing on quality of life. We did a study on MS. So we asked healthy people how much, you know, you can take a drug, we described what MS did to you if you have multiple sclerosis. So you can take this drug, it's either gonna kill you or cure you. And we also ran the same survey on patients with MS who actually had MS. And it turns out the people with MS were less willing to take the drug that would kill them or cure them than the people without MS to whom we described the symptoms. So once you have the disease, a lot of people tend to adapt. So when you're looking at a disease from afar, a lot of things look worse from afar than once you're actually there. So I'd hate to undervalue people's lives because now that I'm healthy, I say, wow, all those things look really bad. Uh, I wouldn't want to undervalue their lives uh, because I think a lot of these things are not as bad once they actually get there and adapt to the situation. Okay. Well, let's uh, give them a round of applause.